the LEI uh, and you know what it meant, etc. Uh, off to you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, I hope you can hear me okay. Um, I'm very honored and delighted to, to be with you today, and I'm very grateful for the invitation. I hope that you can hear me. Um, I will last my uh, slide presentation. If you would allow me that, please. Ah, yeah. Here we go. So, um, I'm the CEO of an organization called the Global Legal Entity Identifier Foundation. And I'm going to talk with you today about where we are today with the LEI program, um, the growing and enormous public and private sector support for the program. And um, I would also like to give you an outlook of what the program means for the digital economy and the topic that we're discussing here as well, digital trust. The LEI today um, is, uh, an, is a, uh, an identifier for legal entities worldwide. We have at the moment almost 1.8 million LEIs out there. Um, we have um, a growing number of LEI issuing partners, uh, which you can see here, 39. Um, GLIFE itself, my organization, is um, monitoring um, this network managing the technical organization and legal standards, checking for compliance, data quality, all of this. Um, we are a central unit, if you like, in this network. Um, we have been inaugurated in 2014 uh, in the aftermath of the financial crisis. Uh, as you can remember, um, after the Lehman collapse, it was very clear and very obvious that financial institutions could not quickly determine uh, their exposure and their risk and their counterparty uh, information. And so the G20 gave a mandate to the FSB um, to think about ideas and how these issues could could be avoided in the future. And one of the many things that they created was the legal entity identifier system for a global registry, if you like, for legal entities. Um, our organization is a uh, a Swiss foundation, not for profit. Um, Switzerland was chosen to be completely neutral from any political influence. Um, GLIFE is overseen by 71 regulators and 19 observers on a global scale. So we have central banks, we have security regulators, insurance regulators, and others. And among the observers, you will find uh, the Monetary Fund and, and other organizations. Our board consists of 16 independent directors. Um, that come from the private sector. As you can see here, the private-public partnership already established itself in the governance structure where we have um, a public body, the Regulatory Oversight Committee overseeing GLIFE, and we have the private sector in the board um, managing the GLIFE journey. Um, as you can see, the global contribution um, at the moment is pretty much, you know, coming from the from the center of the Western world. Um, and that is very natural because um, that's where the crisis started. That's where the derivatives contracts um, got under pressure uh, after the Lehman crisis. And you will see, for instance, in North America, predominantly securities regulation around derivatives. Um, Europe took it to the next level and extended um, the regulation, the, the mandatory use of the LEI in, in reporting. Um, to cover all capital and money markets. So in Europe, for instance, all issuers of financial instruments traded anywhere in Europe, plus all the counterparties of the financial institutions must have an LEI. And that doesn't matter where in the world they are located. And that's why you see so many countries having uh, co companies with an LEI. These are usually then organizations that um, work with a European American um, counterparty bank. But what I would like to highlight is that we see now the fastest growth in Asia. And we're very proud to tell you that uh, with India and China in particular, we have 
two nations that have adopted the LEI broadly, and I will speak to that in a, in a second. From a regulatory landscape, <clears throat> as I said before, um, the vast majority of regulations and rules are coming from, uh, from North America and Europe, but you can see on this map exactly what I just said, there is a, an increased um, demand for the LEI in other parts of the world as well. We enjoy a truly tremendous public and private sector support for the LEI program. And please allow me to say one, one word about the funding of the program. Um, at the beginning, um, it was very clear that we had to act fast. So there was no way um, to establish a global kind of like text-based uh, uh, financing for the system. Um, the regulators also did not want the users of the data to pay for the data. And so they decided that the registrants, those legal entities who want to obtain an LEI, have to pay a small fee. Um, the cheapest offer at the moment is in the area of $50. Um, and uh, with this uh, financing in place, um, the journey began. And uh, today we, we see an enormous interest on the regulatory side, let me just highlight a few. Um, the European Systemic Risk Board, um, which is one of the latest uh, publications, they are recommended to the European Commission to create a legal framework for establishing the LEI for all European legal entities by 2023. So we give our fingers crossed because that could be then um, a, a massive surplus of LEIs um, in Europe. The Financial Stability Board uh, just recently um, published their stage three report, the Roadmap for enhanced, Enhancing Cross-Border Payments. Um, it is very obvious that um, regulators have started to look into the LEI in other parts of their, um, of their fear, not just security markets, but also payments. The LEI is good for any type of financial transaction and counterparty recognition, and that includes payments. And uh, so did the, bank, the, the Basel Committee of Banking Supervision, as well, sound management uh, for the LEI in order to manage risk in money laundry and financing of terrorism. And uh, in the same direction, the European Banking Authority just recently published a consultation as a response to the European AML Action Plan. Um, I mentioned already the demand, the growing demand in, in China, and uh, I, I would like to um, demonstrate here what we have heard from our colleagues in China on their plans. Basically, they want to double the LEI every year um, as part of One Belt, One Road initiative. Um, what you will see um, quite interestingly here is that China has already started to think about using the LEI for importers and exporters and import-export declarations. As far as we know, China has a mandate that for 29 countries in the world, mostly those with weak identification scheme themselves, um, the LEI is mandated to uh, identify the, um, the origin and the producer and the importer of goods to China. Um, we see also a growing interest um, from Chinese um, certificate authorities to create a digital version of the LEI. We'll come back to that later and I will explain. In India, um, very proud, it's the first country in the world that has really um, put out the rule for the use of the LEI in payment messages by April 1st in 2021. Um, there was an announcement from the Bank of England. Bank of England is also going to use the LEI in payment messages, but that starts uh, a little bit later because, you know, they are dependent on the re-ramp of the payment system with using ISO 20022 messaging standards. India has already <clears throat> put this rule out. Of course, it starts for payment messages over a certain size, but India, India is known for lowering these thresholds over time to cover more and more counterparties of financial transactions. And uh, in the Indian system is also remarkable that not just the financial institution re is required to have an LEI, but also their customers and counterparties, um, which is a big difference to, for instance, what you know from the, from the SWIFT network, the big code. Um, we see also a growing demand uh, from the, from the 
private sector. The International Chamber of Commerce has just recently published a uh, identity management guide in which the LEI is covered. And from our talks with the ICC, especially in the area of digital identity, we know that there's a, a huge interest in the LEI program. And please stay tuned. You, you will hear uh, more from the ICC uh, in the course of the next few months. Again, we're looking into traders, exporters, importers, manufacturers, retailers, um, service providers, government agencies. So it's a pretty broad um, coverage that the ICC foresees for the LEI. With this in mind, um, I would like to go into um, our program for the digital economy. And before I do that, I would like to give you a live presentation. So let me see if I can share my screen with you. Um, this is our website. Um, you should be able to see our website now. And uh, on our website, um, you can search for LEI data free of charge. There's no barrier. You don't even have to log in. Let me try this just now. Um, we have at the moment, as I said, almost 1.8 million LEIs. And let's have a look for Hong Kong. And there you can see that in Hong Kong, we already have 9,351 LEIs. And if you click on one, uh, what you see here is the LEI number over here, but then you see the, the referential data, um, like the name of the company, the English transliteration, um, where it's registered and under which registration number, in this case, Hong Kong, the entity legal form, which is a new ISO standard, and I'm very proud that uh, Glyph has been chosen to manage this standard as maintenance agency. Then you see um, legal domicile and headquarters address. In this case, it's the same, but think of situations like a company being um, incorporated in Delaware, but operating out of New York, then you would see uh, two different addresses. Some registration details, the registration date um, and the registration um, update uh, was just recently. So we have in January this year on the 4th, uh, the first um, issuance of this LEI to this organization. And it came from um, the Chinese uh, uh, issuing party. An important aspect is that we also cover parent information. So you see here, this is the direct parent of this organization, while the alternate parent reports an exception the ultimate parent is a natural person and the LEI system does not cover natural persons. We only cover legal entities. But of course, if you click on that direct parent, you see exactly the same structure. You see the LEI code, the name of the company, where it's registered, um, address, headquarters address, as well as other information um, on, the, um, on the registration details. This was a small um, presentation of the LEI. Please feel free to use our website um, anytime. Again, it's free and uh, we provide the data via file download, via search engines like you've just seen, but we also provide um, APIs for a more computational access to the data. But there's a problem with the LEI. Um, and let me start on the right side with, with examples for verification. So think of it, you have a driving license issued by a government organization and you get into a police control and the, poli the officer asks you for your driving license. What they then do is to take a look at the driving license and then they take a look at your uh, face to see whether the photo on the ID card is the same than the presenter because otherwise the policeman would not be able to determine whether this driving license really belongs to the driver. So you see there's always an, another matching requirement. Or another example, an employer calls the university to see if a job applicant's diploma is real. Uh, there have been a lot of fake recently and uh, employers have, uh, have started to verify and background check on, on, on employers. And the same is true for an LEI. If an LEI is presented to a bank, um, you do not know whether this is a real LEI, whether the presenter is the owner or affiliated with the owner, um, and whether the presenter has the right to use this LEI. Um, the LEI itself 
is, an, is, a, is, a, is a 20 digit alphanumeric string, a database key if you like, but it does not come with a digital identity where the information is cryptographically bound to the private and public key pair of the owner. And as a result of the current situation, um, you must still check uh, whether the LEI is the right one and the presenter is the right one. And these background checks are often done manually and at a high cost. So the common problem is the lack of trust. And when I talk about trust, I mean not the trust in the LEI system itself. That is guaranteed by our oversight committee and the regulatory view on, on, on what we're doing. In this case, when I talk about trust, I talk about computational trust, trust that is usually associated with crypto um, in this space. Now, there are two ways of um, creating a digital identity. So we have on the right side digital certificates and um, um, certificate authorities and PKI. This is a very robust, very matured industry and business, multi-billion dollar industry on, on a global scale. Um, and we have uh, several representatives of, uh, of certificate authorities today with us. Um, I don't want to talk too much about digital certificates, just give you one example. But there is a new um, development, mainly driven by the internet industry in the W3C consortium, um, that is called verifiable credentials. Uh, and I would like to talk with you a little bit about our roadmap for creating a, a verifiable LEI, if you like, a we LEI as we call it, using this technology. Before I do that, um, let's come back to um, very basic information about what you do with your digital identity. It's mainly used for authentication. Um, and uh, as you can see here, um, the um, digital identity can be used in computer to computer transaction, computer to browser transactions and, and, and other means. Um, we also see digital identities being put on, on chips, on ID cards and everything else. So there are lots of identity schemes out there. Uh, where I come from in Germany, there's the European EIDAS regulation, which is a very, you know, new and also uh, encouraging signatory law for digital signatures. So the idea was to bring the LEI together with X509 certificates by including the LEI within the certificate. Um, ISO created a standard, the ISO 17442 standard, um, where it is defined how to embed the LEI in a digital certificate. It's basically an extension with uh, an OID associated with the LEI so that certificate authorities could easily Im embed the LEI in a digital certificate. And I would like to show you an example. Um, we put this example out um, in order to demonstrate the use of the LEI. Um, of course, there are a multitude of other applications possible with this. So our statement of comprehensive income as part of our annual report has been put on our website. But how can you trust the data? How do you know that nobody has tampered with the data? Well, usually you create hash codes and, and other means to do that. And we used uh, digital certificates for doing exactly that. So we signed the annual report on our website. And as you can see here, um, I have a European qualified certificate for Stefan Wolf, and it comes with two additional pieces of information. First of all, the role that I play in Glyph, which is CEO, and the LEI number that you can see here, um, which links back to the company that I represent. With this signature, I testify that this is the annual report coming from, from Glyph. Then we passed it on to our board and um, Jack Hartzing, our chairman, um, signed the report on behalf of the board to state that this is the approved annual report of life. And then we pass it on to EY, our auditors, and our auditors then also um, signed this report. And this is the attestation that this is the um, report where they formulated their audit opinion about. Um, so you, you're not seeing sealing of the content by signing and hashing. You also see a workflow of authority and signing uh, authority um, associated with that. Um, this example is available on our website. Just go to the um, about section in the governance part. You will find the, the report version in um, a machine readable standard called XBRL. Now let's talk a little bit about um, uh, verifiable credentials. Um, 
verifiable credentials basically it mean it's an envelope where you can put data in and then you can cryptographically bound this to the to the keys of the owner um, and you can use these verifiable credentials uh, in multiple ways um, I just demonstrated an example for certificate you could do the same thing with a with a verifiable credential um, but what we really want to establish is this chain of trust with Glyph being the root of trust. So for the VLEI, for the verifiable LEI, Glyph would become the issuer of VLEIs to organizations that are entitled to issue VLEI LEIs to the market. So by issuing a VLEI to the VLEI issuers, um, you can be sure that if you receive um, and uh, verifiable credential from them that there are an endorsed and certified VLEI issuer. The VLEI issuers then can take the LEI to, and on request by the legal entities and create verifiable credentials for the legal entity, so a VLEI for the legal entity. Now this is the interesting uh, point uh, because then the legal entity without the need to go back to uh, any other organization could issue verifiable credentials to natural persons. And I will come back to that um, in the next slide. Important is that at any point in time when a VLEI is presented to you, you can follow this chain of trust and can see if all the organizations embedded within here um, play the right role and this is a valid uh, VLEI. Now, <clears throat> for natural persons, um, you, you saw Stefan Wolf being the CEO of Glyph. Uh, this triplet of organization, person and role in the context is what we try to standardize. Um, so Stefan Wolf being the CEO of Glyph, for instance, would have one LEI, VLEI from, from Glyph, but I might be the director of a board of a an American organization and I would get a different VLEI with a different context in that role. So um, it is not that one person has one digital ID any longer, it is actually a combination of one person acting in the business context in a certain role. And that's what we want um, to store in personal wallets that people can present this information in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion. When it comes to natural people, we distinguish two groups. Um, you see on the left side, top bottom, um, we, we talk about official organizational roles. ISO is actually working on a standard for this as well. Life might become the, the maintenance agency for that standard uh, as well. Um, and that means that we would like to standardize what is a CEO, what is a CFO, what is a director of the board, what are the signatory powers of those people. And um, since this information must be verified and validated against um, authoritative um, sources, the VLEI issuers who issue a role credential will have to check um, this role against public authoritative sources. For instance, Stefan Wolf, um, CEO, is uh, listed in the Basel Registry in Switzerland um, and, and, and there can be verified. This is one way. This is, this is the official role that where the VLEI for the role will be granted by the VLEI issuer and validated against the, the information. But legal entities could also issue VLEIs to legal, um, to natural persons in the context of engagement. For instance, we see applications where um, companies would like to use VLEIs for their um, login um, systems to their, to their IT. So they issue VLEIs to all employees to have a very simpler and, and easier access to computer systems. Or in another example in the healthcare world, um, people would like, hospitals would like to issue VLEIs to patients. Um, it's quite interesting to see that um, with the announcement of the VLEI, and we had about two years of research into this, and we run several pilot projects and POCs and everything, um, it is interesting to see how many industries are now coming to us, the GLIFE, system, the LEI system originates from the financial sector, but the LEI itself is not uh, in any form or shape uh, bound to that use case. It could be used in any industry. And we now see healthcare, supply chain, um, customs organizations um, coming to look at the LEI um, to see what role it could play in order to help them with their with their duties.
For the VLEI schema, we are going to create five different schemas for the GLI, for the VLEI issue, the legal entity credential, the awful personal role credential, and the engagement um, role credential. These schemas will be very um, skin, skinny um, since the information is in our central database and it will point back to the central database so that you would always see the most current information on the legal entity. In order to um, create a VLEI system, um, we have to look into standards and uh, we just recently joined the Trust Over IP Foundation um, as a contributing member from the beginning. And uh, the Trust Over IP Foundation is also a not-for-profit organization under the, under the roof of the Linux Foundation. And uh, it is um, for us a vehicle where we work with them in order to use their standards. Now, I'm showing here the, uh, the four-layer stack for technology and governance. Um, what they have um, developed together with the industry. And uh, we, we like that. It gives us a, a framework that we can operate in. And uh, as Glyph, we have decided to create a credential governance framework, um, which will be certified by the Trust of IP Foundation. And we will create an ecosystem governance framework. And, and there you will find um, a rule of engagement, like who can become a VLEI issuer, what kind of qualification is required, what kind of technology is uh, required, and, all, and all, all kinds of other issues. But also things like, you know, what is a valid VLEI? How does revocation work in this case? A very complex issue, by the way, um, uh, to, <clears throat> to manage this. And uh, therefore, we are going to, to publish very soon our work on those, on those frameworks. Clive itself is not a technology provider, we're not a software house, so we, we try to stay away from software development as much as we can. We would rather like to use open standards um, for the development of this. And we also invite fintechs and other organizations to build product around this. Um, there are a host of, uh, host of products possible around this uh, that uh, we will see coming. And we have a lot of good outreach already to the industry. We invite everybody to work together with us on these issues. Where technology is not available that we need, um, we're using always open source technology. Um, we will sponsor the open source development uh, in order to obtain the required functionality. The frameworks should be ready by um, quarter one this year, internally a little bit earlier, but then we have to go through review cycles. Uh, we would like to publish this. Glyph published basically everything so that people know what's going on. The first VLEI should be, we should be able to see the first VLEI issued um, within 2021. So we have a very aggressive um, rollout and build up plan for this. What we intend to do with this is to create a global network of networks. Um, Glyph uh, VLEIs are not linked to any particular technology or blockchain implementation. Blockchain is an area where much of the thought, uh, the thoughts in, in, in this space originate from. However, you see so many different systems. I just highlight a few. We have, you know, the Hyperledger-based systems. We have the Ethereum-based systems, the Corda-based systems. We have the Alastra Quorum network. But we also have cloud applications that have nothing to do with, um, with blockchain that would like to utilize um, VLEIs. And this is what we do. We build a network of controllers to access, uh, to provide access and witnesses to all these networks so that um, the VLEIs could be used in any of these applications seamlessly. Uh, in order to do that, we need to create the interfaces, of course, and, uh, and we manage these interfaces um, together with our software partners. Important is that some of the information will be discoverable in the web. Uh, I mentioned the legal entity information. I mentioned the role information about officials. Um, that means we're also going to see uh, DIDs associated with uh, the VLEIs that we're going to put on our databases so that people can discover the data, while other DIDs, especially for natural persons, will not make it into our system and will stay completely private. This way, we also obey um, data privacy rules and concerns um, and GDPR compliance is a very important aspect of what we're doing. With this, um, I come to the end of my presentation. 
and would like to uh, see if there <clears throat> are any questions that I could that I could answer. Stefan, thank you very much indeed. Um, it is very informative. I, I'm actually quite interested in um, you know one of the example that you have given uh, on the use of uh, this uh, LEI uh, in, in your example of um, signing financial statements. You know, I, as you know, I, I'm from the accounting profession. Uh, you know, been there all my life, um, and you know, very kind of exciting to to see that that electronic rendering, uh, uh, you know, of of uh, you know the, the signature. Um, I, how far down the, the the track are we in terms of deployment? Uh, you know, you anticipate to see that uh, becoming a norm uh, for not just financial reporting, but for all the other reporting and regulatory filing. Uh, you know, in the uh, uh, you know in in the next few years. Um, as you have seen from my presentation, everything is real. So the standards for the inclusion of LEIs in X509 is they exist. And uh, even under schemas like EIDAS and so forth, the issuance of those certificates is possible. So technically, the, I would check the box and would say it is possible. But you know, having a technology or having a possibility is one thing, but making people use it, using it is a different story. Um, we used the annual report example. We could have used an e-invoice. We could have used signing of contracts. We could have used any other example. But we used the annual report example because it combines two flavors. On one hand, we see a major shift towards using machine-readable uh, files and code, um, rather than presenting a PDF to a to a to, a, to an official. You present now machine-readable data. And machine-readable data means that all of a sudden you have all the issues with trust. How can you trust the data? How can you uh, avoid that it gets falsified? And how do you know in five years from now, finding a file on your computer, that this file was valid at a given point in time? And that's where digital signatures come into play. And uh, I'm very proud to tell you that ESMA, the European Securities Regulators, they have just mandated the use of XPRL across Europe for all listed companies. Um, ESMA put our report um, from a Swiss foundation, from a small Swiss foundation, if you like, on their website, on the European Commission's website, to demonstrate to all firms in Europe how this could be accomplished. Right now, we're working with the certificate industry, certificate authority industry. We have just created a stakeholder group for that um, to discuss with them the options on how they could embed the LEI technically into their systems. Excellent. This is exactly what we are also doing uh, here, uh, you know, working alongside the certificate authorities uh, industry uh, to to achieve that. This is just really great. Now, uh, uh, you you also commented that you'll be coming up with standards uh, and and kind of in terms of you know who can be issuers and and, and so on. I mean, I'm just interested in terms of the uh, um, you know the, the the registrar or the issuer of LEI at each country level or territory level. I think do they tend to be uh, government organizations or private sector entity this this morning you know we uh, uh, for the early morning session uh, Drummond Reed mentioned that uh, GS1 is also one of the organization and and you know GS1 is, is uh, a, a kind of an industry association uh, you know it, it, which started involving in barcoding and uh, you know these activities so I just want to get an insight from you in terms of who these organizations issues are going to be going forward. The creators of the system, and I, I must say I was not there when the system was uh, thought through in 2011 to 2012, um, had in mind to use local knowledge. Um, a global registration scheme done by a central organization that would not work because you need a lot of local knowledge. And so a federated system was established with multiple issuers who have the right to issue LEIs in certain jurisdictions. So they have to test with us, they have to, they have to show us that they are able to issue LEIs in certain jurisdictions that they have access to authoritative material and, and all of that. Now, depending on the region, depending on the country, you see a variety of organizations that have um, started to do that. You see on one hand, government organizations like SAMA in uh, Saudi Arabia, a government organization that is becoming the has become the official issuer in Saudi Arabia. 
Same in China and, and, and other countries. In India, an organization was created under this framework. Um, so we see a, a number of, of government organizations doing that. And we see business registries. We have already seven business registries who are also uh, issuers of, VL, uh, of LEIs. Plus we have private sector organizations like the Bloomberg, like the DTCC, like the London Stock Exchange, who operate on a, on a global scale. Now that is for the LEI system. That is the governance framework that was created for the LEI system. For the VLEI system, it's a little bit different because the VLEI, the electronic version of it, we see three groups of organizations, um, four groups actually of organizations that are perfectly suited for, um, for issuing VLEIs. It could be that LEI issuers would like to develop that skill and add this as an additional service, but not all of them will do that. We see certificate authorities um, because they have all of the, all of the things that we need here um, already at hand. Certificate authorities are ideal candidates for the issuers of BLEIs, but so are fintechs and banks. Uh, you see a lot of movement right now among banks um, to grant digital identity um, to their clients, and they could also uh, be an interesting group of VLEI issuers. So that's what we have in mind. We developed the system there and parallel going to develop the go-to-market strategy um, to have as many of these organizations as possible with us. Right, and as, as it just happens, that there's a question from the uh, audience. Um, you know, we, 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 are, we touch on the subject of verifiable credentials uh, and it's, it's about organizations. Is there a risk that you know, organi these organizations may, may jeopardize the overall trust of the LEI uh, and, and is there a mechanism to distrust uh, you know, any organizations that turn out to be naughty or, or, or so on? I'm very grateful for this question because um, the regulators back then believed that also the bad guys should have an LEI. It's better to know them than not to know them. So the LEI is not the differentiator whether you are an organization that works perfectly well or whether whether you have discovered to be a fraud set. Legal entities could have an LEI. However, what you can do with the LEI system um, is, or with the VLEI system in particular, you could revoke VLEI. So you could say, for instance, that a certain organizations and all employees and all officers will be excluded from the usage of VLEIs and a Decentralized hierarchical PTI, as, as we have in this envision, would make revocation possible at real time speed. So, um, it's still required to do the necessary background check by somebody, but technically we would have the means to, um, to, um, revoke those, the LEIs individually. That, that, that's excellent. Um, so, you know, uh, I don't think there are any more questions. Um, so, you know, thank you very much, uh, uh, Stefan, for sharing with us. Uh, we, we certainly look forward to, you know, having the, um, the, the, the LEI infrastructure in, in place. And, uh, um, you know, I, I'm delighted to see Hong Kong and China, you know, on the list. Uh, and so, you know, uh, keep, keep, keep uh, watching this space. Um, so thank you very much again.